Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. Her name is Annette Levesque, and she is an amazing person. She actually um, works with e-learning programs. She is a tech, and she helps create e-learning programs. And also, she is an amazing author. She had just recently... Um, authored a book that she's going to tell us about. And she also helps people develop better leadership skills. And she goes, she's going to go more into that um, soon. And I'm very excited to have her on the show because there's a lot of questions when it comes to e-learning uh, programs. They're all over the internet. And what really makes a good e-learning program? And what do we really need to really focus on when we're purchasing e-learning e programs? And, you know, and what are the best options and the best ways to get the most out of e-learning programs since we are going in an age where a lot of things are computerized and technical, you know, what is good and, and what's not good. So, Annette, I'm so honored to have you on the show. And I am very excited to hear you know, your story and what you have to share. So tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Hi, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really exciting to be speaking with you and about me I am an educator I am an entrepreneur um, I began my career teaching actually at the high school level and had a secondary business degree and launched my first e-learning course way back and I think it was 2000 so it was before it was a thing before the pandemic yeah. I've always been pretty tech savvy or tech friendly and love innovation and you know, fast forward a few years, um, I then launched my own schools uh, locally and internationally, specializing in virtual learning as kind of a supplement to to the regular system. It was never intended to replace it. And um, then I sold those. They were acquired by the largest boarding school in Canada. And I continued working on projects, helping other organizations get their e-learning go um, programs going and pursuing excellence in them. I love it. I love it. You know, e-learning, um, I didn't, you know, it got really popular in the last, I would say the last four or five years, you started seeing a lot of more e-courses e coming on and you, you see a, a lot of people have e-courses, but what really makes a good e-course? Like you have um, e-courses in school systems now, you have them in colleges, you, you see them all over when it comes to just learning new skills, becoming you know certified in certain things, you have e-learning courses, but what really makes a good e-learning course versus a not so good e-learning course because there's so many out there and I'm sure as you know there are good ones and they are not so much good ones mm -hmm. Which there's a lot <laughs> there's <laughs> a lot so I think one of the primary things I've been talking about this year is creating engagement and how different that is in an online world versus yeah. a classroom and we know that from all of us actually even outside of education um, we're doing more Zoom meetings than ever and more Zoom presentations and conferences than ever. And it's really challenging to keep people engaged. You know, they can show up politely, but whether or not they're actually listening to you versus, you know, reading their notes and their email and doing other things, if you're not engaging them, they have that ability. They're not right in front of you anymore. And so that's super important. And when we look at younger learners or those in university and college and K to 12, um, it's really important to take a, for organizations to take a, a very good look at how are we engaging our, our learners? What does engagement look like in an online environment? How do we replicate that re feeling of relationship and commitment that we get in a classroom when a teacher is right in front of you? And that's so true. You know, it's very easy. I've seen many people take, you know, e-learning e classes. They put their avatar up and sometimes, you know, they just put it on mute and you can see their eyeballs rolling somewhere else. You know, it, it's it's really important that you keep the listener engaged the entire time. You want them to really focus on you, looking at you, really, you know, jotting down notes. And, and really, you could tell just by the way they're looking at you and their body language, how their hand is, how they're focused on your eyes, you know, if they're really engaged 
or if they're not so engaged. And that could be really even stressful for the person teaching the e-learning class because the number one thing you want is engagement. And that's a, that's a challenge because you have people with all different personalities, but they have one common interest. So you have these different personalities and one common interest, the e-learning class on the topic that you're teaching. How do we keep you know, people engaged. And when, you know, what is good engagement? You know, how do you know if you're going to purchase or if you're going to be in an e-learning class, if this is, you know, if this is the right type of class, like what type of engagement are, are people looking for? Mm -hmm. Engagement is really, the level of engagement is often defined by the level of interactivity within an, an online course or classroom. So, just like in a Zoom session, if you have someone talking at you for an hour, it's much, much easier for us to wander and, you know, the learning doesn't change. So when we look at engagement, if we're, if a really, if a e-learning course is a great course, it means that when you're teaching me something, when I provide you feedback on that, based on my experiences, what do I already know? What do I want to know? That perhaps what you're teaching shifts and alters a little bit. So, yeah. you know, providing students who are learning with choices based on what's relevant to them. You know, if it's not relevant, what we're learning, we're not going to be very engaged in it and we're not going to remember it. So that interactivity, you know, within the sessions, they're saying now we really shouldn't be talking more than five or 10 minutes before we're creating some kind of a task, whether it's in a Zoom breakout room or in different ways, depending on what your e-learning environment looks like. There's so many ways to set them up right now, but interactivity is really key. And it's key, not just for adults who are no nonsense and want to get to it when it comes to engagement. But when we look at younger learners, K to 12 and university and college yeah. students, they really need to feel engaged or you're going to see very, very high incomplete rates and very high dropout rates. And I would also mention that, you know, in today's world, um, when we look at purchasing courses, as you mentioned, there's a lot of people offering what they call online courses and they look a little bit more like digital notebooks to me because there's no interactivity. So when you buy that course, and yeah. there's no real instructor leading you or interacting with you. There's no interaction at all. That's not really an online course. That's a digital book with videos yeah. and things combined in it. And those have the highest incompletion rates. Oh, really? I can exactly. see that. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Now you created a, um, the e-learning course on how to achieve excellence. Is that correct? I authored the book, uh, E-Learning Gold, The Ultimate Guide for Leaders. It was released since last September, 2023. And this book was created, I wrote it during the pandemic, actually, to assist organizations. There were so many corporations rapid launching e-learning systems at that time, and they didn't have a consultant or an expert, and they didn't often have a strategic plan. It was born out of crisis. I called it crisis teaching. And I was watching the whole thing happen and there's so much that went wrong. You know, I saw organizations starting at point A where we were more than 20 years ago making those same mistakes simply because there really aren't, there's, you know, there's guides on how to create a course that are available and there's guides that are very specific to technology that are available, but there really wasn't a guide available to assess an entire program, what makes a great program as a whole and what things should we be seeing in every single course to, yeah. to help make a great program? How do we measure, uh, what benchmarks can we use to measure and determine if we're offering a good e-learning program? What types of data should we be looking at? What should every single course have? So that was why I wrote and launched the book. I think that's an excellent, um, you know, book idea because, you know, what they should be a guide on how to do it because so many people, you know, you see nowadays, you know, are putting out, you know, e-learning courses, but, you know, really what makes a good e-learning course? Like really, you know, what are some of the important aspects that a good e-learning course should have in order for it to be successful and engaging? Mm -hmm. Well, when we go back to talking about interactivity and relevancy, to make those are two of the core components of great courses, 
And to make those things uh, occur, we really need to know a little bit more about who our learners are. So oftentimes, you know, when we picture the old classroom model, teachers used to receive a list of students coming in and they would get to know them over a period of time to uh -huh. be able to modify their teaching and modifying when you're live, you can modify anything, modify their course, but it was yeah. very, very different in an online environment. And so we need to use things like pre-entry surveys for students coming into courses to find out, have you had any previous work or educational experience before taking this course? You know, are you a beginner? Is this completely new to you, Stacey? Or have you been um, studying the subject for a period of time. I mean, we have adults taking e-learning that have already maybe graduated for a program, but they're engaging in professional learning because they want to advance their career. So if you're teaching something somebody already knows, they're going to be really, really bored and that's not going to create an engaging course. So benchmarks like that, we look a little bit at what's important in selecting the technologies for the course, but really it's not a book about technology because you wouldn't be able to even keep up with that. And in the day of AI, it's changing all the time. So I talked to leaders a little bit about what does your technology need to be able to do for you and accomplish for you? And how do you assess what it is you actually need in your program and control the costs while you're doing it? Right. And what are some of the, the things when you're when you're assessing a, a, a course, like what are some of the key components you mentioned two right now, but like when you're going through it, you want mm -hmm. you want components, you want people to be engaged, you know, and so you want people to interact and you want them to, you know, keep them busy and really motivate them and have them use their mind and and not just sit there and stare at what you have to say, but you want them to be actually putting making themselves feel important, making themselves, you know, part of part of the the course themselves and then maybe even interact and ask questions and and try you know because now they're curious about things or they might not know about something and they want to know more you know and then um, you know other people start to ask questions and the ball you know the ball gets rolling and then you really have a really stimulated e-learning course that you could probably play over and over again and then you could even have people you know um uh, listen to it. And then you could, you have continuations of those courses too. So, you know, when you're, when you're doing these things, you know, what are some of the, some of the biggest mistakes that you found too, that you, you find that when you see people making e-learning courses, you know, what are some of the, the great things that you found and some of the not so great things that people consistently make the same mistakes over and over and over again? Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see organizations um, encountering when they're launching their e-learning programs is expecting teachers to also be instructional designers. So when we look again at engagement, there's different types of engagement that happen in the course. There's engagement between the, the instructor and the student. There's engagement between the students, but there's also engagement with the content. And if the content is terrible, and I will tell you, Stacey, when I launched my first course or my first school, yeah. Way back when in 2002, we didn't have instructional designers. So the teachers had to build their own content and someone can be a really great teacher or a really great mentor or a really great leader. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you have the skills or to create um, a really great course adhering to the, the best practices of design uh, yeah. for learning. And so, you know, and during the pandemic, a lot of organizations, teachers rapidly were just taking the materials they had for the classroom, scanning it and, and throwing it up there into the online environment. This yeah. is not a course make. <laughs> so, you know, when organizations are starting and we're looking at content, this is the part that can be so overwhelming. And I really advocate, you know, having an instructional designer, you can have one instructional designer, we used to have uh, a single woman with uh, all of our teachers, we would plan out the launch of our courses and the teachers yeah. be, would become the content experts. Here's what I want to teach. And you can have your, your word documents. Right. But then there needs to, we need to have a blueprint as an organization with our designers about, all right, here's what we need to see in really great courses. Do you have enough white space? Have you left that behind or does it look like a cluttered junk pile of text all over, all over the course when we log in? Is it easy to navigate? Is it intuitive? You know, we all know that a printer button means something's going to print. Are we using consistent um, icons for, yeah. for the functions we need in our course? And I actually created within the book, there's a checklist of, of pages of things that look, this is what we want to see and we should see in every course. Because if the course is horrible, 
and it can be a great ideas and, and teach great content, but you know, it's like a book. It's like anything else. If it's not usable, if it's not user-friendly, then again, you're going to see very high attrition rates and students not completing their courses. And that is the number one, uh, sign of ill health in a program. Yeah. And, and not all programs even measure that often they'll just measure the grades. So in yeah. the old days, if a course was terrible, you'd see a lot of students failing it. And yeah. I used to say, if we have one student struggling in a course, then perhaps the student needs additional help or we need to evaluate, are they in the right place? If you see the majority of students struggling in a course and those averages, now you have a system problem. That's a problem with the yes. course or the way the instructor's delivering the content. And so you need to look at system things. Yes. And, and I've seen that happen so many times. Like I've seen, you know, students go into a course and you have a large majority of people in the course and over 70% of the course, you know, of the, of the people in the course are struggling and they're not making the great average, you know? So that tells you something right there and there. Like you said, it's either the course or the way the, the, uh, the, the professor or the person in charge, the mentor is teaching the course. And it's not, it's not getting you know, across, you know, and, and, and how do you, like, when, when you come across that issue, you know, what are some ways that maybe somebody could fix that? So the course, you know, the, either the e-learning course, you know, or, you know, could be actually more attainable, understandable, and actually more successful and engaging. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's an issue with the course design itself, I really recommend organizations create a template or a blueprint um, for all of their courses, because really, if you don't, and we didn't when we started, Stacy, and I remember when our courses, when we were first, you know, getting ready for our very first inspection, it looked like the wild, wild west out there, <laughs> there had, you know, six colors going off in their courses. And so you really need to have, you know, create a guidebook as an organization. And even if you're just small and starting out, just like all of our other operational policies as entrepreneurs, you can start yeah. to build it as you grow and you add to it and you want to have a style guide for your courses. So yeah. here are the fonts we're using. Here are the colors of fonts that we're using. Here's how many images we're going to have on a page. Here's how much white space we want to see in the page. And by yeah. going through that, you can really um, start to solve a lot of the content issues. And really, I, you know, I am not a designer. Uh, by mm -hmm. nature. I don't love design. Even, you know, there's wonderful yeah. tools like Canva and all of these things. No, I'd rather walk on hot coals. So, you know, <laughs> do the part that you do really, really well and outsource the part that you don't do really well. And it doesn't mean yeah. hiring a full-time person all the time. There's really yeah. great people contracting their services out today for almost yeah. everything um, to help you resolve those issues. But you really need to play detective. And when I meet with an organization suffering from um, really high incompletion rates, I usually will start down the uh, clue path with the interactivity and looking at what the course looks like and how do courses happen, you know, because if, again, if it's not just one course it's happening in, then the, the organization often, they probably don't have a template that they're working from because teachers need that guide as well. Your instructors need it they were yeah. groomed to teach the subject area that they're an expert in. They weren't groomed to be e-learning experts. So they haven't been, you know, and even if you've taken courses, instructional yeah. designers, that's a very specific skill set. So you want someone who's who's doing that all the time. I think that's a great idea. You know, like you can't really wear a thousand hats when, when it comes to like creating something really good. If you really want to do something good, you have to focus on what you do really well and then find people who actually do the other tasks really well. And then together, you know, you could actually come up with something that's really great that will be engaging and resourceful and actually help people advance and elevate to new levels by taking the course and actually learning from it because they're so engaged they're learning new knowledge and it's easy to comprehend and they're getting you know to the areas they want and you know that's where leadership comes in because a lot of these e-learning courses if it's done right you can really spark up somebody's confidence self-worth and really make them, you know, want to be leaders. Like, wow, this is great. I just learned all this information. I could do this, you know, and then they want to be a leader in their, in their skill set, in their area. 
And, and, you know, and I, I think that's, you know, amazing. Like, you know, you are really big when it comes to leadership. So when it comes to leadership and it comes to these e-learning courses, you know, how, you know, how much does it really affect a person, you know, and how it could it really spark leadership in our generations, in our, our, our older generations and our, in our current younger generations that are evolving into our, our future. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, leadership we evolve as leaders based on our experiences and our education and our training, whether it's yeah. formal or informal. And now we have a lot of both today. And I think that yeah. virtual learning really helps uh, provide that, those options for us, especially for adults, you know, who have full-time jobs, you've got a full day and you have a lot of time left over for extra learning. Yeah. I myself, I'm listening to podcasts every morning. I have, you know, a favorites list and sometimes it shifts depending on what do I need to learn based on where I am now on my, my career yeah. journey, on my journey of goals, what's going to be right. interesting to me. And I love the concept of micro learning, smaller snippets of learning. And that's what we get yeah. from the podcast as well. You can get a smaller snippet relevant to what you need. You're building it into your day. If you're listening to it, you can be, you know, making breakfast, making kids lunches, doing the gardening, laundry, whatever, yeah. while you're learning. And I'm also a huge audiobook fan. Way back when, I remember, I think it was Brian Tracy called it automobile school and people he, he used to be driving far with stick CDs or whatever into the, the car to go. But you don't need to do that yeah. anymore with um, podcasts and audiobooks and, and available learning. So I think that ongoing learning is going to be really important to maintaining your skill set as a leader and becoming a leader and professional learning. So it's not just going to be about the university degree you you obtained or the training you got in college, because things are changing at a pace that we have never seen before. So yes. just to retain our skill sets, we need to find ways as adults to build learning into our lives. Of course, yes, 100%. You know, it's so important to consider, we, we move at such a fast pace now, like never before. And it's so important to keep up with everyday learning because something new always comes out and if you really want to be your best you know you really have to be open-minded realize that you don't know everything and be open to learning new things and if even if you're not that great or you have a little hard time comprehending it if you're interested in it find ways to break it down, to make it easier, look for other, other ways, you know, to, that might be a little bit more simplistic. And then you can go back and you can learn it the other way and start getting more advanced, you know, but it's, it's, it's a great way, you know, to be, to have an open mind and to be able to learn. And, and, and you know, in our society, we have to consistently learn, you know, it, it's so important. If you really, really want to advance and you really want to enjoy life and, and get the most out of it, you really have to be an advocate of, of learning. And I know also you are a big um, advocate when it comes to entre uh, entrepreneurial and female entrepreneurs, and you really, you know, try to help them. And, and what are some of the ways and some of the things that you do to help our, our female entrepreneurs in today's society? Mm -hmm. I'm a huge advocate for female entrepreneurship, um, creating opportunities for ongoing education and learning for female entrepreneurs. Um, I think that when we're able to obtain an education or training, it really helps us remain competitive in the environment as entrepreneurs. Yeah. And it really helps us um, equalize our financial capabilities uh, with men. And the fact is, when we don't obtain an education or training or business of our own where we're training in, very yeah. often females will still make less dollars than, yeah. than the men do. And it's not because, you know, it's been crafted or, or in my opinion, it's not because it's necessarily crafted to be that way, but women tend to work more in small businesses. We tend to work in um, careers and professions that just don't pay as well as our male counterparts. Yeah. And I think as things are changing, we need to get men on board with that as well. And realizing that your daughters are, you know, the, the women in your life, that we, it's really important to have access to these educational opportunities. And it's really important to provide the things women need to have access to those uh, educational opportunities. We're often more responsible for the children. I was on part of the uh, Women's Day International podcast with a 
lovely group of women from around the world. And I kept hearing them discuss childcare again and again and again, women with young children, it can be very difficult to attend extra training opportunities if childcare is not available or not affordable for them to do that. And that's one of the unique challenges that we experience as women when we're on our journey, or if you're taking leave to, to have children as well, that can take you out of the the workforce for a period of time and make it more difficult to obtain the financing you need to, to launch a business. So, you know, the, the things that women experience are, are very different. And by joining communities of other women and learning Um, from each other, we can really advance our, our opportunities for training, learning, building and growing our own businesses and achieve that financial equity that we're seeking. A hundred percent. And I, I think when you, when you start to bond with other women and you listen to them and you, and you start, you know, listening to, if you're a part of the teaching course, or if you're a part of, you know, just learning from other women, you know, um, sharing their, their thoughts and, and their ideas, um, it, it really sparks light bulbs in your head because sometimes, you know, you, you don't realize there's other ways of doing things, or you might, you might feel a little insecure because you, you, you know, you have these issues, you know, and you have these things that you're trying to overcome. So you could be successful entrepreneur. And sometimes it could be, you could feel like you're the only one, but then you hear other people talk and you realize that this is a common, a common problem in, in, the, you know, in, in, a, in an entrepreneur, female entrepreneur entrepreneurs um, society, you know, in our industry. And you, you don't so much feel like, you know, you're the only one that, oh, wait, you know, this is common, you know, it's not me, it's it's something that's going on with everybody. And then you find solutions as other people are talking, it's like, wow, I didn't, you know, I didn't think about that, I could really do that. And that could probably benefit me, you know, and, mm-hmm. and also having the support, you know, when you have so many women that are open to really helping each other, like, yeah, contact me, here's my email address, you know, you can contact me at my website, you know, and you start feeling supported and that, that, you know, it can help your, your confidence too. And, and getting support, getting, getting knowledge from each other can really go a long way. And, you know, I think also the, the burnout feeling too, is, is that, you know, you have so many hats to juggle, you know, so a lot of women, you know, they feel, you know, burnt out or they don't know how to manage time, right. Because there's so much they're trying to do and, you know, you don't want to burn out and you want to you manage your, your, your day properly and get the most out of it and be successful so how do you do it and then like you said you can go to e-learning and you can go to these courses and and there's plenty of them you know to teach people how to break things down and to have interactions especially when you have courses where people are interacting and you could actually have engagement these are amazing because you come out of there so feeling with so refreshed, so um, you know excited, and you have so much more new knowledge that you could utilize and and put forth in your own career or your own life, you know, and it could really help you overall. Mm-hmm. And it's really important to as well as you're saying when we're looking at courses and learning and growing finding our peeps and our community for where we want to go. It's a game changer for us. And, and that's why I see when I'm talking about courses and engagement, I myself have bought, I have fallen susceptible to those courses that are going to teach you something really, really great. I bought yeah. one on hyperbolic stretching. Stacy, I was determined. I'm like, I am not flexible enough. I need to learn to stretch. And I saw this thing that, Hey, if you do this in 30 days, you're going to be better at the stretching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sign up paid the ticket, bought the thing. I was getting these, this email blast coming at me every other day. Do you think that I did and I, any of the hyperbolic? No, I did not do it. <laughs> because there was no accountability. There was no instructor and there was no one to collaborate with while I was in it, you know, yeah. and collaboration, especially amongst women and entrepreneurs, you know, we've got yeah. entrepreneurial organizations now join the, it doesn't have to be just women, but join your chamber of commerce. I was part of um, a global entrepreneurs group. And, you know, as you see these groups for larger and larger businesses, the number of women involved in it becomes smaller and smaller. And that was really telling in itself. But we really need to find your peeps because as busy women, by the time you're done with all of the duties that you have as a woman in your, whether it's your house, your family, your day, your, your job, we really need to know what do we need to invest our time in when it comes to learning. We don't have yeah. time to try out 50 different tools to, to no. pick one. 
And they always say, if you want to know what's coming, if we want to know what's most popular right now for the tools, what are, what is everybody else finding that's working for them? You want to know what's coming, ask somebody on the way back on their journey, surround yourself with people who are already on that journey and we'll get to where we need to go. Fast tracking. Yes. I love it. I love it. You know, it, it's so important to do that. And, you know, I find that when women, women can really, you know, bond together and really, you know, look at things and start to really, um, you know, grasp, you know, what's important, what they need to do and have the support of other women. And then you, you realize that, you know, after you gain that confidence, it doesn't matter if there's only a few people in your industry that are women that are doing it. If you have support from other women in other areas, you know, and you have the, the backup and the knowledge that they, they can supply to you and the ideas, you could really create something really grand and you can actually break out where you're not a pea in a pod anymore. You're, you're this successful woman who is making a name for herself and you're standing out, you know, and it, and, and anything is possible. I always believe you can take any dream, become a reality. And if you want to be a leader in your industry, you by all means can, you just have to you know learn the industry learn who you are get the right help get the right knowledge you know take the right courses get the get the instructions and guidance from the right people get the engagement make friends make support groups you know stay in contact with all these people and grow with these people and before you know it a lot of times you see people just flourishing and they're still in contact with all these people but now they have a pair of wings and they're flying and you know they didn't have that before so with with e-learning and being able to do things the right way and being able to really um you know have successful courses successful interaction successful you know um bonding with people and and being able to understand things and then utilize them and apply them and that's a big thing too is is completing the courses and actually and utilizing them because anyone we can complete a course but are you going to utilize the tools you use and that's a main thing is is really paying attention to the tools the strategies and the techniques that they're teaching and applying them to your to the to, the, to, the, to your life and your career you know whatever works for you with any tool any any techniques that they've taught that you feel that could benefit you and even taking a chance, even if you don't think it might work, but oh, I'll give it a try. You know, sometimes, you know, I've done things where I've been taught things. I'm like, I don't know if that's really going to work. And then I try it and it does it, phenomenal things for me, you know, and I feel, you know, e-learning and, and also with female entrepreneurs, the bonding, the e learning together, the interaction, the engagement, it all, it all circles into one big thing and it can help so many people in so many industries, not just female entrepreneurs, but everyone from kids to teens, to, to young adults to adulthood, you know, and you just have to have the right courses and they have to be constructed the right way and miracles could really happen. People could flourish and grow to any extent, any extent possible, I think. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we all have different, differing levels of um, yeah. needs and independence when it comes to courses. And again, maybe you don't need to take a whole course. Maybe you can only commit to a workshop or Maybe it's going to be, you know, uh, levels of micro learning, smaller yes. snippets. Maybe that's what you need right now. Maybe it might be right. podcast episodes on a particular topic, or maybe you need a temporary coach while you're going through parts of your process. Yeah. I remember when I was writing my book and I'm like, I have a master's degree in education. I can, I can write. I know how to write. I can, I've got all this knowledge for 20 years yeah. and I'm putting it together. And as I'm going through the process, I had all of these options. And, you know, sometimes as women were such planners too. So yeah. when you said just going ahead and getting started, I was thinking, well, should, should I be going in this direction with the publishing? Should I go in this direction? I had all these options. And I finally reached a point where I was like, you know, I've been working at this for a while in the pandemic. I think I'm a little lonely and I think I need a book coach. I don't want to, I don't want anymore to, to be going through all the options. Yeah. I want somebody to tell me what they would do. That's already had yes. this experience as a woman. And I want to yeah. go with that so I can get my train moving again. Cause I had stalled in the process. And once I did that, things started moving very quickly because I had somebody to meet with every week that I was accountable to and yes. was setting the goals for me and said, you need to figure out this, this, here are your priorities for this week, you know? 
Yes. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a course that we're committing to in professional learning for three months or six months or one year. It might be a, yeah. a workshop. It might be a coach. It, it maybe, and maybe, you know, we need to, if we're working from home, maybe we need to get out of the house and actually go to a face-to-face -face conference. Yes. Maybe that's where we're going to have our best learning. So each woman, yes. we need to evaluate ourselves and think about when do I work my best? When have I worked my best? And then ask those questions about a course or a workshop or a program. You know, is there going to be an instructor? How do you create engagement in this for me? And evaluate for yourself. Is this going to be a fit for, for your current scheduling needs, your current learning needs? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. If you had to take today's session and today's podcast, if you had to really focus on some um, really good turning points that you would like to emphasize on, what are some of the things that you'd like to emphasize to our listeners? I think that the greater the amount of technology we're exposed to and the, the more tech that's running our world, the yes. more personal we need to be and the more interaction that we're going to require in these things. So we can use technology to create courses that are, are give us scheduling flexibility and um, flexibility in where we learn and how we learn, but we still need, we're, we're essentially human centric. So yes. the more technology is involved in something, actually the greater the impact of human contact. And we need yeah. to not lose sight of that. As fantastic as it is to think, oh, if I just do this on my own, I don't have to plot another meeting in my calendar. I'm not going to have to bother with anyone else. It's actually the human interactivity that propels us forward. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to remind organizations of now. There is a room and there's a role for, for digital books, but I mm -hmm. think you know, the less interaction there is, the shorter that type of learning needs to be. I don't right. know anyone who is going to complete a course with no interaction that occurs over a space of six, eight weeks. It's not because you were lazy or didn't want to do it or couldn't get going. We're just, we're naturally human centric. And we really need to consider that yes. in the things we're providing, whether it's to, you know, learners, clients, um, colleagues, yeah. we're human centric. It's very true. Oh, that's so true. So true. And and what are and can you remind everybody about your book title and where they can find your book? Yeah, the book is E-Learning Gold, The Ultimate Guide for Leaders. And it's available at all the major bookstores. And you can also read more about it on the, the book website at elearninggold.com. I love it. And where can people find your website again? www.elearninggold.com. I love it. And, and what are some of the services that you provide? Uh, I myself, I provide consulting services for organizations, schools, universities, and colleges. Um, anyone looking to either maybe revamp an e-learning program that they perhaps launched during the pandemic, and now they're going back and reevaluating it if the program is yes. struggling. And I can also help people design the blueprint for the type of learning they want to launch if they haven't yet launched their e-learning program and they're considering it and they just yeah. need help, you know, organizing their blueprint, figuring out where do I get, what do I need? What type of a team do I need to, to get this done? And where do I find them? I can help right. with that as well too. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. I love having you on the show. I think it's so important because you don't hear people talk a lot about e-learning and the right way to do it and you know and how important education is in our society you know you have so many programs out there but you know a lot of those programs aren't done the right way and it's so good that you have a, a guide to teach people how to create programs and and courses that are going to promote success because that's what you want you want to go through a, a program and you want to have success in it and you want to come out with new knowledge that you could utilize in your current life. And it's so important what you're doing. And I just thank you so much for, for, you know, bringing this to people's attention and showing people, you know, that there are ways to do it and you're showing them how, which is, I think, amazing. Thank you so much, Stacey. It was really wonderful. This was a great discussion. And uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to be here and share some of the insights I've uncovered over the, the past couple of decades of e-learning. Yeah, I, I'm glad to have you on the show. This has been amazing. You've been a wonderful resource. And I thank you so much for coming on the show. And I hope, you know, we'll have you back on. This has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
You have a great day. You too.